So let's do this. Let's do. Let's share the presentation and step through a few slides and announcements, uh, and then without any any more messing around, we're going to bring Sarah in to discuss alert fatigue. And on that note, I'd actually like to say good morning, Sarah. How are you? Morning. I'm fine, thank you. Yeah, I, you've, I see you've got an awesome jumper on for this talk. I do, I do. It's a full star, but you can only see like the top half of it. <laughs> Fantastic. And dare I ask, how was your Christmas break? Um, but quiet, <laughs> like everyone's, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Um, it was all a little bit bonkers, wasn't it, over the Christmas period? Did, did Sarah, did you think the government were going to, did you really think everything was going to be okay at the back end of, uh, as we went into this new year? Uh, well, no, no. I, mean, I, I think if you were following any of the statistics, it looked very much like a lockdown was coming. I was actually, what I was worried about most just before Christmas was that they weren't going to take action. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's, uh, we seem to, it seems to be a lot more people that I know that have got, got coronavirus this time around than last year. Yeah, it seems so, like containing solutions. I think we were all excited about ending the year and we managed to end the year on a high. Mm hmm and then we all came back thinking, oh, this is going to be fantastic. Everything will be back to normal. And actually, things seemed worse than uh, they were before the Christmas break. Yeah. Yeah, it's been uh, nice. It was nice to have a break, even though, you know, even though no one got, got away. I think pretty much the, the Financial Times pretty much shut down for two weeks in technology anyway. Um, and uh, it was good for everybody just to, to get away. Yeah, yeah, clear, clear. Right, I'm just going to... Pop my shares. Now tell me, Carla, what, what did you think those slides were all about? You probably saw Boris Johnson. Yeah, I mean, I, I read an article yesterday that he was cycling very far from his place. I don't know if you were referring to that. <laughs> no, 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 I wasn't actually. Um, I was confused by the police on, the, on that tiny bike. <laughs> I wasn't I'm, sure about that. No, no, indeed, indeed. Um, I'm going to explain this. I'm just getting my slides up now. Just bear with me for one second. Um, uh, one second. Also, just for everybody's information, Andrea is Jamie's wife. That's why you can see Andrea in his name. Yeah, on, yeah on indeed. Zoom. Now, I'm just... Uh, how do I share the screen here, Carla? Uh, I don't think I'm logged in as, in a, as a, an administrator. Well, I've made you co-host, so you should be able to share screen. Mm -hmm. Do you have the green thing below that, ser that says share screen? Yeah. I think, it's, I think there's a system setting problem on this computer. One second. I have to quit and come back in. I'm really sorry about this, everybody. One I second. Can, well, Jamie, I can share on your behalf if you like, and you can just say next, and I, I'll just go. Yeah, in fact, that's fine, let's do that. If it's good enough for the government, it's good enough for you, Jamie. Uh, indeed, uh, yeah, okay, that I'll do my, my best uh, Chris Whitty uh, impression. Okay, <laughs> so, so first of all, let's um, let's get those, that's your screen shared then, Carla, and then we can start stepping through. So for everybody, uh, maybe top of the presentation, please. So for everybody, welcome back and happy new year. So for those of you who were with us last year, what we've been focusing on with uh, what the fuck is cloud native are all the different uh, elements uh, of the things we care about, whether they be culture, uh, technology, SRE, security, stop laughing, Adrian. And this year, in the next 12 weeks, we're going to be focusing on a, a, a different set of more advanced topics. And that's why we're going to be speaking today about alert fatigue with Sarah. Next slide. We do have a few announcements with regards to what's coming up. Next slide. Uh, but today's theme is now the thing is what, what the very next thing we're going to be talking about next slide is of course uh, conferences and if you look back to the maturity model this is really all about cloud native culture how do we communicate within an organization how do we share information and how do employees and even users affect the policy policies in our organizations one of the ways we do that is with internal technology conferences. And so Matthew and Victoria will be joining us. Is that next, Carla, or is that two webinars from now? It's next on the 28th of Jan. Yeah, so not, not next week, the week after. Exactly, so if we skip to the next slide, what we're gonna be doing next is focused on 
the um, third part of the maturity matrix, which is around teaming and organization. And specifically, next slide, we're gonna be looking at uh, site reliability engineering, or what we call at Container Solutions, CRE, Customer Reliability Engineering. But these things are very similar. This specific theme is in a much wider set of activities that we're currently going through, which is about cloud native operations, what we call CNO. So for those people who are interested in SRE, site reliability, 24 seven uh, uptime and reliability, which of course Sarah's gonna to touch today, this is what we'll be doing with Nathan uh, over in February. Now, we were then supposed to go into WTF. Uh, what is the gossip? Oh yeah, the maturity matrix, of course. Thank you, Carla. I forgot about this one. The maturity matrix itself is just an output. It's just something that comes out of a systematic gap analysis. You can hire container solutions to do that gap analysis for you, or you can follow the link that Carla is about to share in the um, uh, chat box, and you can download an empty maturity matrix and all of the instructions that will help you uh, to succeed with it. Okay, next slide, please, Carla. And what we were, yeah, so you have to go back one. No, go back one. So what we were supposed to do with these slides, it was gonna be a new feature and it was gonna be the, uh, the week in summary. So the first piece of news was uh, the prime minister of Great Britain uh, is sulking because he's discovered that you can't log into AWS and claim that you're cloud native. So it was meant to be a caption competition. The next one, okay, you could move forward now. The next slide was meant to be um, uh, as the incoming Biden pres presidency uh, is upon us, already many American police forces have begun to defund. Anyway, you get the picture. And of course, the third image was going to be Donald Trump joins his classmates as they have taken, had their toys taken off them. But the next time, I won't be 15 minutes late and we'll do the caption competition correctly. Um, and that was meant to be a little bit of light humour because God knows we, need, we all need it right now. I, mean, I so, think we covered that already, so... Yeah, ex yeah, exactly. Second impeachment, I mean, that's something. I mean, I thought I was a bad leader, but oh my God. Um, so, without too much messing around, this is what's about to happen. We're now going to bring in Sarah and we're going to be talking about alert fatigue. Carla and myself will monitor the questions in the chat box and we'll interrupt Sarah, we probably won't interrupt very often, but we'll have, ask questions in real time. More likely, we'll ask the questions at the end of the talk. And it's okay to be as specific as you like. The first time we did these webinars, we finished dead on time. So what we've done now is extend them so that there's lots of time for Q&A, uh, questions, comments, discussions, and most people really like that. And most people actually hang around uh, for that part of the talk. So please, Unmute your microphones and give a Container Solutions Happy New Year round of applause to Sarah Wells, Ooh. technical director of the Welcome, Sarah. An all round. Happy good New Year, everyone. Welcome. Thank you. Happy New Year, indeed. Right, I'm just going to share my slides. If you could let me know that you can see that. Yes, we can sure. see that. Sure. Excellent. That is good news. Right, so I'm going to talk about alert fatigue. So I, um, I'm a technical director now at the Financial Times, but I've been there for just over a decade. And when I joined, I was a senior engineer and then a principal engineer on one of the first teams to build microservice uh, based systems. And when we started doing that, it was probably six or seven years ago, we were very, very early adopters. And because we didn't really know better, we did monitoring exactly the same way we did for our monolithic systems. So. You know, we monitored uh, CPU use, um, we looked at whether the file system was getting full, and basically what that resulted in was um, an inbox that looked like this. So I would come in and see thousands and thousands of emails, and um, email is a really bad way to find out about problems because the way that you set up your email for reading emails, so threading very small amounts of information, is rubbish for knowing what's going on here. So come in and see this, think, well, what, what is going on? And it's really hard to tell. There's nothing there that tells me where the problem is. And I've got thousands of alerts, 
probably all from one single problem at the, at the bottom of it. The interesting thing with this is about a day into investigating this worked out that these aren't my systems. Some other team had copied some monitoring configuration and sent all of their alerts to our mailing list. It just took time to even work that out because uh, it's so, so um, noisy. So this is really, uh, it was a very stressful thing to have this amount of, of alerting coming in and it, and it causes alert fatigue. So I'm going to talk about what alert fatigue is, which is, it's what happens when an overwhelming number of alerts desensitizes those responding to them. And there's a lot of discussion about alert fatigue in uh, medical settings and aviation, where obviously if you have far too many alerts and you, do, and you start to be unable to cope with them or you miss an important one, it's a life or death situation. Now, it is extremely rare that it's a life or death situation for most of us as software developers, but you suffer from the same problem. And there are several aspects of alert fatigue. The first thing is just too many alerts. If you are getting single alerts in at a time, you can respond to them. You can look at them and work out what's going on. But when you start to get hundreds in a day, you can't really properly investigate them and you you just have to choose which ones you're responding to and if you're going to choose between alerts you you don't probably have good enough information to know which of these are, which of these is the one i should look at first the second aspect when you start getting lots of alerts is the alerts where you didn't need to take action and these are things like you get an alert at 9:24 saying there's an issue with the system operability score and then within the same minute it says, oh no, it's okay. And that kind of noise is, is absolutely awful because you get distracted and then it fixes itself. And, the, and that level of false alarm, that's where there's the real problem with aviation and with medicine is all the false alarms that you have mean that you might miss something critical. And then there's just the stress and the interruption of alerts, particularly if you're supporting them as, a, as someone who also is trying to write code. Every single time that you, um, get distracted by an alert you lose your flow and if you're being called and woken up or being called late at night it has an impact on you in the next day so lots of alerts even if they don't result in you having to do something in fact even worse if they do result if, if you don't need to do something they can really cause you um, a lot of distraction in the rest of, of the stuff that you're responsible for it's worse once you adopt cloud native and actually, it, when we first started doing microservices and then containers, this was something that really caused us a lot of pain. And there are a couple of reasons why it's worse in this situation. Uh, but first of all, I want to talk about what I mean by cloud native. So I, I saw Holly giving lots and lots of different um, uh, definitions, but this is the one I like, which is cloud native means building systems that benefit from the cloud rather than just running on it. And you can obviously use the cloud and just take your monolithic system and stick it on an EC2 box and take your database and put it on another box. And you get some of the benefits of the cloud because you've got um, much simpler provisioning, uh, quicker provisioning, you've got uh, scaling. And there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff you benefit from, but actually for cloud native, you can build things differently. And when you, uh, when you adopt cloud native, uh, you can use microservices, you can deploy in containers, you can release far more often. Um, you can use the things that your cloud provider offers like queues and databases. So you no longer have to uh, maintain that. You could go serverless. All of these things allow you to concentrate your efforts on business value, uh, which is great because you're basically building stuff, not maintaining it and supporting it but they make the alert situation uh, worse. So why does it lead to alert fatigue? You probably just have a lot more systems. There's a lot more moving parts. This is our operations dashboard uh, for the financial times. So these are the critical systems that we most care about. And um, there are a lot of them. And you have, so you have a lot more individual services that go wrong, you have a lot more monitoring checks but also your systems are distributed. So whereas you might have made a call between uh, from within process, quite often now for delivering a certain bit of functionality, you're making calls over the wire and that's just flakier. So you, when, you're, when you're making an HTTP call, um, you, you could have it fail and you have to retry. 
So things will potentially, um, a higher percentage of your checks will fail. Well, so this is fine actually, because we build these kinds of systems differently. We build in resiliency. We uh, do things like um, running multiple instances in multiple av availability zones, probably in more than one region. Here you can see we run in a US and UK AWS reg region. We optimize for um, resilience by building in things like retries. We, we will make sure that if we have calls between two microservices, if it fails, we'll, we'll retry. We probably should back off and then retry a bit later. Um, and we put in things like queues that decouple to try and uh, make sure there's a bit more chance for systems to go up and down without it having an impact and causing alerts. But it does tend to mean that if we are looking at all of our individual instances, we might get alerts because one instance has failed and is being replaced with another, but actually it's a false alarm. We're, that's going to fix itself and I don't want to be woken up for something that is going to fix itself. And this is basically the wider, the wider thing is that complex systems, distributed systems are generally in a state of grey failure. Then they're, they're not, it's extremely rare that if you look at monitoring a complex distributed system that there is nothing that is currently in some kind of state where it's being, being um, auto scaled or where it's a couple of requests have failed. So they run in a degraded mode, but it's okay because they're degraded in such a way that the things you care about still work. There's a backup, there's something else that allows you to, um, to recover. And I looked at our um, I looked at our system and I saw that we at the moment we've got a little over ten thousand checks set up and they run approximately every five minutes. This is you know, in general. So that's three million checks a day. And what that means is that a one in a million event happens three times a day. So really, really very uh, low probability events will happen when you're running this and um, these number of checks. So so that's where um, cloud native makes things more painful, but also, and this is a very selfish view, for a lot of developers, it's the first time where you're the one that's feeling the pain of the bad alert. When I first worked at the Financial Times, I would write my code and it would get packaged up into a release and the release would go out and maybe someone would call me if something went wrong associated with that release. And at this point we were doing releases for our, for our website and publishing once a month because we had to take, we couldn't publish the news while we were doing a release. So obviously you have to be very careful about when you do that. Um, but now um, it's me that that gets caught, that gets the alert if something goes wrong. And this is a screenshot from uh, PagerDuty from a few years ago, where Dyn, who were our DNS provider, were DDoSed. And uh, so I was at a conference actually, and suddenly everyone's phones buzzed, and they were taking out laptops and looking at it. And I started getting these alerts, uh, and I thought okay, uh, quickly established that the problem was DNS. The problem is PagerDuty also used Dyn. So I couldn't turn off these alerts because I couldn't get into PagerDuty to turn off the alert. So the entire time that Dyn was being DDoSed, I was getting a text message from PagerDuty uh, a couple of times a minute. <laughs> um, and But basically you're feeling this pain. So how can you make things better? What can you do to address alert fatigue? The first thing is you can't address it unless you take this stuff seriously. And this comes back to you build it, you run it. I don't think that you can benefit from cloud native and, and the real benefit from cloud native is you can move faster and you can do more releases. You can get more business value out there. I don't think you can do that um, if you don't, um, if you keep that separation between uh, operations and developers. You, you, if you're changing rapidly, you can't keep another team up with the change. And also, there's a reason why DevOps is a good idea in general. If if the person feeling the pain isn't in the person that set up the conditions, you have you have a problem. You need to have the right influence for that. You do build things differently if you're the person who has to respond at 3 a.m. Uh, it is absolutely the case, especially after it's happened a few times. You're thinking, what can I do to make sure that I um, don't get woken up? And this is a good thing. Like you're the best people to decide what it makes sense of to monitor your system. And if you're thinking about how you'll run them while you're building them, you will definitely get a better outcome. 
And some of that is about the monitoring you set up. So here we have uh, for, we've, we've set up failover and it happens automatically if the good to go endpoint says there is a problem in a particular region will fail over to the, to the other region. So that's like, that's a developer saying, I don't want to be working up for this. I, I want that to happen automatically rather than having some operations person get woken up and have to deal with it. Um, and you make very different architectural and design decisions around resiliency and redundancy. I'll give an, an, a detailed example here, which is that uh, one of my teams is responsible for information about all the systems that the FT has. Uh, we call it um, BizOps, and it's a graph database that links together systems and teams and people and information about runbooks um, so that we know who owns what, and alerts are linked to it too. But it's, it sits on a graph, and uh, we only have one cluster for that graph database. And that's deliberate because it's very hard to manage multiple clusters in terms of consistency. So if you can avoid it, that's a good thing to do. But obviously it is absolutely critical that the system that contains the information about how to troubleshoot um, failures with ev for every other system in the FT, it's an extremely high priority thing. Um, going back to the Slack out um, outage, I think one of their problems was their observability tooling broke uh, as soon as, as the other stuff broke. You, know, the, you, you have to prioritize your observability stuff uh, uh, differently. It's the super important stuff. Anyway, what they decided to do was uh, we extract the key information for system support into a flat file and stick it in S3 in multiple regions. So that is, that is there, it's incredibly resilient, but it simplified the architecture for the actual graph database because we've accepted that uh, one, once a day exporting the runbook is, is um, totally acceptable and it avoids any synchronization issues. The reason you need to, the reason you need to be um, responsible for the monitoring is because you also need the power to stop and fix things if they're too broken. It's, it's very difficult for a separate operations team to say, we've been working up five times this week because of your system and have any impact on what happens because the people building, building the product are saying, well, you know, but we need to get this functionality out. If you are the same team, there's a really good chance that, that you can at least have that discussion. Uh, and, and it can be a difficult discussion with product owners and, and uh, delivery leads, but, but it's a discussion that you need to, that you need to have. And I saw a really good analogy about this um, recently on Twitter, which was that it's basically like operating a restaurant. So, you know, sometimes even in the busiest restaurant, you need to stop and clean the kitchen. Your business is about selling food, but if you never ever clean the kitchen, you don't scrape down the grills. Eventually the food is inedible and you'll poison people. So I think if you can explain this to people, like, you know, we're basically building up a lot of pain and everything is getting harder. You have to be, you have to be willing to invest. And I think moving to cloud native, um, it means a higher percentage of the time for a development team is in doing things like that. And for people in product and, and delivery, they, they, all they see is, oh, well, you know, one of these five developers in my team is spending their entire time doing this. Well, everybody else is moving faster. So that's, a, that's fine. That's a good thing. What we've tended to do in our delivery teams is to have some people focused on responding to problems um, during, during the day and other people able to fo focus on, on um, delivering new functionality so we this in this particular example which is our um, ft.com team uh, there is a team called ops cops um, which uh, which basically they, they're doing support they're responding to alerts and to reported problems um, so we're minimizing the impact on the team as a whole we don't have 50 developers respond all responding when there's alert we know exactly who's responsible for res for working out what's going wrong um, and we rotate people through that so you're gradually sp spreading knowledge of all of the systems that make up ft.com by going through this team. Related to this, systems uh, and alerts need to be owned. And this is an easy thing when you're first building a system. And, and we generally say that, a, that, so every alert we have is tagged with a system code so we know what system it relates to. We say they should be owned by a team, not a person. You will constantly have conversations where someone says, oh yeah, so-and-so knows about this system and it's not really under active development, so it's fine, but they leave or they move to another team and that team doesn't prioritize it. So they all need to be owned by a team. And um, 
you need to maintain that ownership because it's really often what happens is people move on to a new project and then you say well who knows about um this project and so oh no no one's worked on that well someone still needs to patch it someone still needs to fix it if there's a problem so that maintaining that ownership is quite important and one of the ways that we um kind of push people to realizing this is we have team dashboards and it's all based off the data we have in our systems database so we've linked alerts to systems to people and we show you all the things we think you own so the reliability engineering team at the financial times currently owns these systems and sees can see all of the current state of the monitoring for those so that prerequisite is you won't improve this unless you uh treat it seriously and unless you're actually um, owning the fact that monitoring is your problem. But in terms of alert fatigue, there are a couple of things you can do. The first thing you want to do is reduce the number of alerts. And to reduce the number of alerts, the easiest way you can do that is reduce the number of checks that you run. So, you know, you don't actually have to support every system 24 seven. And I think that if you go to conferences, the people that you hear talking tend to work in domains where where there are there is some criticality and people do use things 24 seven, but very, very large numbers of the systems that we have at the Financial Times are used by people um, during their working hours. Or even if they're used more generally, could wait a bit until people fix them. And what we do is we have a definition of service tiers where a platinum tier is a system where um, we've said we need 24 seven support for it. So for us, the website, and being able to publish content. Uh, we might not say that being able to log in is a platinum system. If we've got the ability to say everyone could get into the FT with that, but we could, if we can remove the paywall and let everyone in, we could wait until the next working day to fix that. The conversations are hard because if you ask a stakeholder, um, do you want this to be supported 24 seven? They're going to say yes. So you have to tie it into other things. So, so for us, if it's a platinum system, it gets 24 seven support. It has to run in multiple availability zones in multiple regions, which means it is going to cost you more to run it. And it is going to cost you more to build it because it's more complicated. So we can try and explain to people, if you go for a bronze system, which is supported in development team working hours, uh, there will be less of, there will be less effort to try and make it run multi-region. So the first thing about checks is, is basically to say, well, you don't have to keep doing the checks. The second thing is to be a bit more realistic about how, how soon you need to know about a problem. This can make a huge difference. If you check every five minutes versus every 10 minutes, you're halving potential number of alerts. If you've got uh, systems where, um, Maybe there's auto scaling. Uh, maybe in the 10 minute period, something will be detected that there's a problem. The instance will be destroyed and a new instance will be fired up. You do not want to uh, get alerted for that because it's been fixed by the time you get in front of your laptop. Um, if you think in terms of the business. So for us, it's like, well, obviously news is important, but the Financial Times is not a news wire. The news that we do is is a is as it's as much about our analysis and our comment so that means there's a difference between sort of 30 sec three seconds 30 seconds three minutes response time uh to something so you can tune you can basically tune down uh your alerts and you can also look at being quite clear about severity so for us um and on this here we've got severity three is something where you want to know about it but you don't need to wake anyone up so that could be, oh, well, it looks like we've, um, it looks like we're starting to run out of, of space on this box. It's not urgent. You probably want to know about it, but you don't need to do anything right now. So that's another thing is to think about how you change uh, that. Um, the next thing is around focusing your monitoring. Um, it's not just websites, but we do it for websites from the perspective of your client, you don't need to be doing that at every at every level, but it is important to do it from the perspective of the client. Um, customers of the Financial Times do not know or care that we have a CDN in front of us. So, if we're monitoring, um, if we're monitoring from the point of view of, of is the is the website okay? 
that should be based on the, exactly the same route the customer would take. And we use Pingdom to do uh, monitoring from uh, around the world. So we can check, we'll, we'll normally pick up if there's a problem in a particular region as well. So, so it's that basic, where, where's the most important thing to be doing the monitoring? And then this is uh, something that I got quite interested in over the last year or so, which is thinking in terms of business capabilities. So when you look at our operational dashboard, there's, there's hundreds of tiles. And when something goes wrong, uh, lots of them go red, but it's very hard to immediately know what the impact is for us. You know, if someone said to me, that looks really red, what does it mean? It might take me a while to say, oh, um, it means that we can't publish the news. It means that, so, that people can't register. So we've started looking at defining the key business capabilities that we have within the Financial Times and then saying which of them are brand critical or business critical. So brand critical would be the sort of thing where um, it impacts the brand if we can't do it. Business, so that would be things around the news generally. Business critical are things where it's really important to us, but it's unlikely that it would feature as a story on The Guardian if we got it wrong. So if our customer care systems are down, it's business critical. If our website is down, it, it's brand critical. Um, and so we started looking at, can we monitor those business capabilities end to end? And that normally looks a bit like an acceptance test, but it's running in production all the time. And it's, um, it's never gonna, we never want to have any sort of fixtures that we have to set up. We want it to be real data. So for digital publishing, we're publishing an article repeatedly and checking that it makes it through all of our systems. So what my, my, my kind of aim is, is to have one dashboard with about 10, less than 10 tiles on it, that if it's green, I know that we're in a good situation um, for technology at the FT. The interesting thing about doing business capability monitoring is most of them we've realized that um, it goes across multiple different teams at the Financial Times. So if you're looking at publishing content, there's a team that manages our editorial tools. There's a team that manages publishing and content APIs. And then there's a web team and an apps team. To get this monitoring working, they all have to work together. And that means they have to actually understand all the boundaries between their systems. We have found things out while setting this up that have surprised everyone. And we've documented it as part of setting up the monitoring. So it's got us a lot of value just from just from doing that. But basically, this focus on the, what, what actually matters to you um, really, really helps. So once you've reduced the number of checks, the next thing to do is to reduce the number of alerts where you can't or won't do anything. Because they're just, they're not, they're pointless. <laughs> it's quite hard to spot some of them. But you know that that is that's what you that's what you want to be doing. So um, the first thing is just the obvious things where don't report failures of the things you depend on. So if a date if there's a problem with a connection from a service to a database or a database goes down, you get alert from that service. Do you want an alert from every service that calls that service? It's just a tree of alerts and an enormous amount of noise. Um, so you have to think about this. Some of it is around your architecture because if this if you don't need to make synchronous calls here then then maybe you could say let's say you're writing to a database maybe you have a queue in there so as long as as long as the the producer can write to a queue it's healthy as long as consumers can read from a queue they're healthy it doesn't really matter if the database is down for five minutes because everything will catch up um, can you add in retries um, load balancing things where it would it fixes itself and um, you can reduce the, you can change, extend the time before you would alert anyone about it because um, your system will call one instance, it fails, it calls another instance, it succeeds and you shouldn't get an alert in that case. Related to this, um, you want to be, sh to make sure you are testing the flow, you're testing a flow that is the same as the flow that's actually happening for real in the business. So quite often we end up with people going, oh, you know what, I'm gonna, my service calls this service, so I'll call that service's health check and see whether it's okay. And actually the health check might be down, but the, the business functionality is working or vice versa. If you're not testing the same thing that you actually rely on for real, you just get spurious noise for that. Um, I think one of the interesting things about the move to cloud native is that we rely on third parties a lot, whether that's the actual cloud provider or also 
whether we've got someone uh, operating a database for us. And that's great, but you need to work out when you're getting alerts because something's gone wrong with a third party, because probably you can't do anything. If something goes wrong with Amazon, there's there's very little we can do. And there's not really much point in us opening like tickets because they know it's affecting a lot of people at this point. Um, so I think making sure you can tell that the problem sits with that third party. And if it's something that's very specific to you that you can connect to them. Um, I think for critical parts of your estate, you want to think about what you could do uh, if it if a service went down. And this isn't really related to the software, but we have alternatives. So if Slack goes down and we use, uh, we have an instant bot in Slack, but if it goes down, we have alternative ways of communicating with people and ways of tracking incidents. It's good to have had that conversation before the problem, but you can normally work out something. So redundancy in every, in, in, in all aspects is good, um, but sometimes you accept the risk. So when we had that Dyn DDoS a few years ago, we didn't have a backup DNS provider. So we really just had to wait for it to recover. And maybe that's a risk that you think is okay. You have to assess each of these independently. Um, what One thing that is true is if there's a third party that, su that supports a lot of things on, on um, the internet, people may not be worrying about whether they can read the Financial Times. They may be worrying about whether they can see Netflix. And the news stories will be Netflix outage because of, because of this rather than the Financial Times, probably. Um, but we would generally be multi-region for our critical stuff. So once you have um, tried to reduce the number of checks you do, tried to reduce the number of false alarms you get, the next thing you can do to address alert fatigue is just try and make it less stressful when um, an alert does fire. Um, because when you're doing this for the first time, say you're quite a junior developer, it's absolutely terrifying to get an alert and think, if I don't fix this, maybe the Financial Times uh, fails to publish a newspaper for the first time it's in, in its entire history. That, yeah, we've, we've never missed an edition. <laughs> and uh, I don't wanna be the, first per the person in charge of operations the first time that happens. But that, that kind of thing is very stressful. So you need to think about how you support people um, so that they feel like, um, it wouldn't be like it wouldn't be totally scary. So raising an incident shouldn't be something where people hesitate to do it. So we make it very easy to report incidents. Uh, there's a Slack bot. We encourage anyone to use it. Uh, we use it's a modified version of Monzo's uh, open sourced response bot because they'd done a lot of work here. So we thought let's just um, let's just use it and see if there's anything that we want to do differently. But we, we installed this in a week. We could have taken months going around and gathering requirements, but we installed it in a week and then we asked people for feedback and we've gradually made changes to it. But anyone can open an incident um, and we don't really measure the number of incidents we have. We certainly don't report on it and we don't like reward people on it. When I first joined our operations uh, team, we, would, we had some some uh, metrics that we used about like number of incidents. I don't think it helps. I want people to tell me if there's a problem. I want us to all address things. And also, unless you're a, a large company, a lot of it is statistical noise. If, if you've only got, if you only have like um, 30 call outs a, a year, like the fact that there were, that, that eight of them were in June is not statistically significant. But as soon as you start talking about them, people, people are thinking, oh, look, June was bad. So we don't really do that. We have a gut feel for things that are causing a lot of uh, problems and need work on the stability and resilience. We do measure the number of times we call someone out of hours because we don't like doing that. That's a bad thing. So we measure that um, because that suggests something that we can actually take action to have better better um, documentation, better resilience. We have a first, we have a 24 seven first line team. If they can fix it for you or if it can fix itself, that, that's better. Um, optimizing for collaboration. Uh, this is another thing people sometimes want to do about incidents, which is like measure the cost of responding to it. And if you're not careful, you go, okay, number of people, number of hours they were on. Oh, this was a costly incident. I want there to be loads of people responding to an incident if that makes it better for the people involved. So obviously there's a, like, you don't want 58 people. But, but you might want four or five people that are working closely together and they'll probably solve it a lot more quickly and each of them will be less stressed. 
So, you know, optimize with the collaboration uh, with our with this uh, response bot. Uh, we automatically create a Slack channel and for normal operational incidents, it's a public channel for security incidents, it's private, but for operational incidents, anyone can join it. And we often have people turn up, see that there's something up and join the channel to see if they can help. Uh, that that is great. It just makes people feel uh, supported and and basically makes them uh, know that they can ask questions. So it only works um, if you have uh, got a culture of openness and safety. If you're if you're running an incident and suddenly forty people come into the Slack channel and some of them are more senior than you, uh, in a culture where people are used to someone saying, "Well, whose fault was this?" that's not going to help. But if you've actually got a culture where people say, what can I do to help? Uh, we had a, a big incident um, about a year ago where a script went wrong and we lost a lot of our DNS entries, including basically everything on FT.com, <laughs> which as you can imagine was terrifying. But if you joined the incident channel 10 minutes after the start of it, you didn't actually know what had happened. What you knew was the work we were doing towards fixing it because that was the that was the focus. And so we write up instant reviews. They sit in an internal uh, repository that's visible to everyone and that anyone can go and look at. Now, obviously lots of developers will never look at these, but they're there and you can refer to them. You can search for the thing that you are trying to deal with now. And maybe you find out someone um, had an incident on it six months ago and it's got a useful link to a dashboard that you didn't know existed but you do need to spend time on this culture and it needs to you need to but everyone needs to believe that everyone believe that everyone thinks it from the cto down um we uh, well victoria is going to talk about um internal tech conferences so we have a tech conference at the ft called engine room that we've run, been running for five or six years now and in the last one in december we ran the kickoff session for it was six people talking about production incidents they've been part of so we we went and got people who'd been part of interesting incidents got them to talk about it how they felt and what they learned from it because we wanted to we want to encourage the culture that it happens people do people make mistakes and then they fix them and we learn from them and it's all okay. So that culture takes, you need to consistently demonstrate to people that that's what you care about. Out of our support shouldn't be something to endure. It should be sometimes um, when you're supporting something, you should be feeling engaged by a problem. So uh, we run incident workshops uh, in some parts of the FT where people come along and they, they basically practice on an old incident. They're shown the messages that came in, the alerts, and they walk through it and they realize the approach that people take to solve an incident. So this, um, this la lets people get a feel for what it would like to be involved. And our out of hours um, support for most teams uh, is optional and it's not on a formal rota. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Firstly, is we have some teams where there are not that many people who really work on this system and know it. And you can't ask a team of four or five people to be doing formal on call because that's a huge burden on people if they can't, you know, if they if they can't go off and you know go for a walk in the country, go swimming, whatever, post pandemic. Um, so we often do a best endeavors um, approach where we have a list of names in the spreadsheet and we phone around and the, and we just hope we'll, that someone will be available. And so far that has been the case, um, but it's voluntary and people can can opt in. They can opt out temporarily or permanently. Obviously, sometimes you have things going on in your life where this is not a thing you need to do on top of it. Like someone's got a newborn. They're probably going to opt out of doing this for a while. But actually, we want our systems to be pretty resilient. We want people to be called extremely rarely. And this wouldn't work if people were getting called all the time. So for most of our systems, you aren't getting called that often. The good thing about having something like this is um, that when people start opting out um, in droves, we know something's wrong. So if we've got a rotor that suddenly no one wants to be on, we have to stop and say, what, what do we need to fix for you to feel more confident about that? You, um, if you're doing cloud native and you have a lot of teams that are empowered and are making their own decisions and working away on stuff, you do need to invest in things that support all of them. 
So uh, developer productivity is an opportunity. And if you've got lots of teams, all of whom are spending a certain amount of their time supporting their systems, can you have a central team building them tooling that makes everything that they're doing easier? And uh, this is something that Team Topologies, which is an excellent book, um, talks about enabling teams. So teams that enable the, the business focused teams to deliver fast. So these would normally be, you're building tooling, you're building visualization, you are experts in a particular area. So you're advising and you're helping. Maybe it's training. So uh, one of my teams, uh, the reliability engineering does this. They're an enabling team for, for all of the stuff around operations and resilience. So one thing that we have done recently is, well, we think it's good for you to be able to to see where to focus your efforts. If you're in a state of alert fatigue, it's overwhelming. I'm getting hundreds of alerts. What, I don't even know how to start tackling this. So this is a Grafana dashboard we've got where we can tell you which of your alerts are the noisiest, which of them are changing state or firing the most in a, in a set period. If you can tackle those noisy ones first, you can make a dent in, in the amount of noise you have generally. So we found this approach works a lot over a range of things. Show people where they should focus their efforts, make it really easy for them. And if you're measuring things as well, if you work in a company that, that uh, works with um, OKRs, so objectives and key results, um, if you can provide a tool that gives someone a score on how they're doing, they will be much more likely to set up an OKR. Because frankly, when you're thinking of key results, which need to be measurable, being able to use someone else's tool to say how you're doing is, is, the, is a massive advantage. And so, sort of related to this, I guess, is thinking about people's mentality. So it is extremely hard to convince people they can delete an alert. Even if this alert is really noisy, they're just really worried that, oh, I'll delete it and then something will go wrong and no one will know and it will be my fault. So what you can do is, is give them tools that let them do part of it. So you can pause it for a while. You can change how often it fires. And it gives people the confidence that, oh, I paused it for a week and uh, nothing, nothing went wrong. There, was, there were no fires. So that actually just gives you um, a halfway house. So to summarize, Alert fatigue, it's the overwhelming number of the alerts that is desensitizing those responding to them. So you need to have fewer alerts. You need fewer alerts when you're not going to do anything. Um, and you need to reduce the stress uh, when it fires. And that is it from me. Very good, Sarah. Thank you so There's much. Two people. So you couldn't get a better compliment than really this Really good. This is Thank pure you. gold. <laughs> Nobody, nobody's ever said that about my, my talks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I've not had a chance to see any of the chat because I've been looking at my, um, my no, slides. No, so. Of course not. That's our job. Uh, amazing talk. Absolutely excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you a lot. Pure gold. Uh, so et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Fantastic. So some questions, Sarah. Yes. If that's okay. Yeah, uh, of course. Uh, Loads of comments. They just keep coming now. Very good. Led a few, oh, can, can I get a job at the FT? Oh. <laughs> I mean, we, yes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, there are there, there are definitely, if you go to careers.ft.com, uh, there will be some jobs listed there. I will ask Carla to find that link and put it in the, the, the chat box so that person can check out your site and maybe yeah. apply. Yeah. Right. There's some very interesting questions here. The first one is, if you ask people to build it and to run it, you're essentially creating asking them to be extremely responsible for both their work and the consequences of their work. Now, we would think that this is either entrepreneurial or very high performing. Does this mean, do your people change into high performers? Do they get paid more as they develop in their careers and take on these extra responsibilities? How does that work? So, uh, well, there's a couple of aspects there. So the first thing is, um, it's a cultural change to go from being a team that um, writes code and gives it to someone else to being a team that actually takes more control. And like any change, some people will absolutely embrace that. 
uh, some, so there's always like 20% of people are really keen. They'll go, yeah, this is brilliant. There's a, there's a midpoint of people who, who are dubious of any change, but when it happens three months later, they say, well, this is okay, actually. And then there's a group of people where this isn't right. This doesn't suit them. Um, and those people often they will decide they want to, that, that this isn't for them and they'll go somewhere else. But the, the thing that we saw is it's tied to benefits for people. So because when, when um, before we did this change, uh, if you wanted to put a co-change into production, into test even, you went to a change advisory board on a Tuesday and the change would go into the into test on a Thursday and then it would be batched up and go out on a Saturday and you would maybe have to support that. Um, you had a lot more constraints on the on the technology you could choose because you could only choose the technology where we had central teams that could support it. So the message to our developers was you are asking us for a lot more freedom to choose different approaches, but that's fine. We will let you have that freedom, but you're the ones that have to support it. And actually people will, provided they believe that you will give them the opportunity to fix things up, they will do that. And, and we did have a painful painful few years where there were a lot of conversations about um, I don't want to do out of hour support I don't want to be on a rotor and actually the, I think that's why I'm quite happy with the best endeavors approach because we're not really making people change their lives hugely um, we are slightly reliant but people who are very dedicated and, and interested in their job like make themselves available that that um, the DNS issue we had in February last year um, we sent out a service message and it happened about nine o'clock at night and just loads of developers just got their laptops out, put them on their table and dialed in and said, what can I do to help? Because they, they feel a connection. So, so some of it is, um, it's much more interesting. It's interesting technology. It's interesting to be, in, to be able to make decisions. So people are willing to do it because of that. Um, Did it become contagious? So as some people left the organization who were not into this stuff, that obviously you're then left with a larger critical mass of people who take responsibility for the work. Did yes. that spread? Did other groups see what you were doing and become inspired? And, yeah. and in general, did you perform in other areas? Did the performance go across the board? I think I think it is contagious. You see some other team, and, and the way it started at the FT was that we had a we had a company called Asanka who uh, um, who built the first FT mobile app. I mean, this is before my time, but I think they basically got in touch with the FT and said, you should have a mobile app. And they were a small startup who, that we eventually bought. But they, people would say, Asanko do things more quickly. And the answer was yes, because they don't go through a change advisory board and they just release it and then they fix it if there's a problem. So people saw what they had done, including our business stakeholders. And it was a lot easier to, to get, um, get buy-in from someone in editorial about, would you like things to happen quickly? Sometimes you'll tell us that this looks a bit wonky and we'll fix it quickly. Is that okay? So, so the demonstration, start, it does start to spread, um, definitely. And, uh, and people have, you know, there are, obviously everyone has concerns. And a lot of it is, is, is actually, it's very scary to think that you might have to, you might have to be responsible for something critical for for an organization so well, that support is really important that support and yeah so the reason i asked earlier about entrepreneurship is because once upon a time i was an engineer and then a team lead and then i had so much responsibility i came to the conclusion i should just start my own business so that's what i did uh, that was nearly 20 years ago <laughs> So that's it. so. It's what's interesting for me is that I'm in charge of operations and reliability, and I'd never done an operations job. This basically building microservices and getting interested in how do we support this led to me taking over responsibility for all of that at the FT, because it was just like, oh, we can do this better across the board, and we need to do we need to change other aspects of it. So I think. Yeah. I, yeah, I mean, you will have some people who will not be that interested, and we still we will we have people at the FT who who are not on out of hours rotors and you know are basically working pretty standard old school developer. It's right. you can support that. Now, Sarah, I'm gonna I'm gonna invite some of the other participants to ask a question or to speak, but I've got got one more follow up with regards to all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Are you supported by your bosses? How does that work when you start to tell them we're going to shift our culture? Did they even know what you were speaking about? Cloud native, DevOps, automation? So I actually think that there were key people in our leadership team that supported 
this and that that's why we were able to do it. So we had directors of engineering who totally got this stuff. And then we just, and then after a while, we just, so um, uh, Kate O'Ridden is our CPIO, so Chief Product Information Officer, and um, John Cundit, who was our CTO at the time, they're both more from a product background, but they could, they would trust that if we were saying this and if we were demonstrating that we were improving our ability to support things, um, they were very comfortable to support it. And, then, and, the, and they're very supportive of the cultural side of it. They totally see that it's important to be demonstrating that uh, all the way down. Um, so I, I think sometimes people, like when I talk to people about how do you make this change in an organization that doesn't get it, the, the traditional way to do it is a team does some automation. <laughs> you know, they normally go, we're going to do some automation or we're going to adopt this technology and then we'll show it to people. And that that is a really that's a really good thing but eventually you have to do the cultural work of convincing people and getting that if you don't have buy-in from leadership if it gets to the point where something goes wrong really wrong and your CTO says but actually who was the person who did that then you then you, you've lost a huge amount of um of your cultural capital there so yeah. you have to stop it yeah absolutely I, I i could discuss this all day but we're going to open up the question now so i think ian we're going to bring you in because you've got a question and as ian's just about to unmute himself and ask that i would also invite anybody else in the group if they would like to ask a question either send it to me in a private message on zoom or if you're comfortable speaking in such a large setting unmute yourself and please just speak up so on that note ian come on in Hi, Sarah. That's a fantastic talk. It um, really resonated with me because I used to run an operations team for third line support uh, dealing with, with high frequency systems. Mm -hmm. um, the thing I was really interested in, and you did you did touch on the solution at one point in the talk, but I, I'm interested to talk more about it, is you talked about when, when apps uh, aren't developed anymore, when microservices, those teams sort of wither. Mm. Um, and then you get to a point usually with with management where you have to sort of say we need to keep investing in this team and they say well we're getting no business value from it from investing in it anymore it's it's just you know can't we do, just move that those resources somewhere else um and you said something about monitoring that i was interested in so you monitor things about the app but i was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that and how that's managed and how those situations are are, uh, are managed yeah it is really difficult because particularly find that some of our product owners honestly believe that systems will just carry on forever with no effort. And you have to spend the time to explain that, yeah, we need to patch these things. We need to, we, we, we need to up, upgrade. We need to generally be responsible if something goes wrong. Um, we, we've been investigating the idea of total cost of ownership uh, for systems We've done a little bit of work there where we we basically say well this system that exists this product that exists that you're no longer really hugely invested in it's in a kind of sustain uh, stage um this is what it costs to run it it's about 50 percent of a developer's time and it's this much hosting costs to be able to say um there is a cost to the fact that you're keeping this running are you making enough from it and to try and and make sure that there's a conversation of is it, you know if it's literally sitting there with no investment and still raking in the money fine that's great but it, it is costing something to 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 do it that is a that's a hard thing in terms of making sure you have someone who who actually is responsible for it that's just i have i've just spent the three years that i've been in this job um saying to people everything needs to be owned by a team surfacing the information about the things that aren't owned by a team and um asking people what, what they want to do with them. So uh, recently the FT.com group, which is made up of about eight or nine teams, they, they basically, there's another um, uh, post on our blog about moving to durable teams where they were doing a lot of project-based project -based work. And that meant that there were systems that no one was investing in and no one was owning. Well, now they have divided it up. So everyone, everyone has, uh, every system is owned, even if they're not actively working on it. So we know exactly who we would contact. Um, if there's a problem, but I, th I think this is, it's worse with microservices because there's so many moving parts. Um, so yeah. Yeah, and it, it, it's the cost of maintaining that knowledge in people's heads. I mean, you, you can document, but you still have to have people who, who have a mental model of these applications that yeah. may not be looked at for a long time. We see the same thing with platform teams. 
So, you know, you build your Kubernetes platform, your GitOps infrastructure, and then mm -hmm. management say, great, we can get it to write application code. You say, no, no, we need two or three engineers to maintain this and, and build on it. That so, is a big, that's a big thing to try and persuade people is that we now need to have a, a percentage of our engineering uh, effort is always about maintenance. Because the other thing about um, microservices and things like that is every bit of maintenance, like a migration, if you've got to do something 150 times, suddenly it's extremely painful. So um, we use Circle CI and recently Docker Hub introduced rate limiting and there was a period where the, they hadn't solved what would happen if you were, because uh, Circle CI used, used Docker Hub and we were starting to look at what do we need to do to fix that? And it was like, oh my God, we have to migrate uh, hundreds of um, hundreds of build pipelines to, to mitigate this. Right. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steer the conversation sorry. now, Sarah and Ian. Thank you for the question, Ian, and thanks for speaking up. The, the two other gentlemen have got something to ask, which is Andy and Stephen, and we're going to start mm -hmm. with Stephen. Come on in, Stephen. Welcome. Hi there. I hope you can hear me all right. Um, thanks for that. What, what, a, what a positive message. I mean, it's great to go to, uh, you know, an IT talk that sounds like something out of, uh, of a self-help book. I'm, I'm kind of reminded of that, that mantra, you know, be the change you want to see. It's great, isn't it? And yeah, I have to admit, it's me that put the, the, the comment there that said, you know, where can I drop my CV? But <laughs> seriously, I'd like to touch on this, um, the culture of, culture of openness. And mm. that's what I really want to try and encourage in, in my teams. I, I, and I think you, you, you made a very good point earlier. Um, the devs and the, and the techie people in general are really interested in this stuff. You know, a, a lot of us kind of do this stuff in our spare time. Mm. Now, no disrespect, but a lot of project managers you meet don't manage projects as a hobby. <laughs> how, how do we, um, how do we, uh, maybe you don't want to talk specifically about FT, but um, how do we encourage that culture of openness so that people from those different backgrounds can work together to kind of achieve this, this great way of working? I, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily, I think we, we, we have a lot of openness with our project managers. And, and actually, I, I, I think it's, um, you have to see that there's no penalty from that. And a lot of that is about the demonstration, um, demonstrating that. So, so, you know, I try as someone who's in a relatively senior position to say when I don't know something or to say when I'm having to work it out as I go. Or to say, I don't know about that. I'm going to have to ask someone else. You know, demonstrating that it's okay to not be on top of everything, and you know, uh, your actions are the thing. So you have to say it, but then you have to demonstrate it, um, and you have to you have to set, sell it. So you kind of want to sell to your senior leadership and to other parts of the organisation the impact that that trying to work this way has had. So you know, we looked a lot with instant reviews about how do we um how do we do them in a way that is blameless how do we use that to find out um what we can do to improve and ultimately that comes from everyone who manages incidents um or no manages the reviews at the ft steers people towards what can we learn from this and how can we make things better and away from who was the person who did this and uh you can only do that if you if you know that leadership kind of agree with it as well. So I'm not no, sure if I completely answered the question, but I, well, no, I think it's actually, okay. it's actually really interesting you say that because just, just talking a little bit about the railway, when we talk about safety culture, that's the way we improve safety, improve safety on the railway. Mm. Zero blame. Uh, very much the same approach as aviation. It's about learning from what happens for everybody's benefit. Zero blame. Yeah, well, this is this is where so where I was influenced is people like John Allspar at Etsy, who's been talking about this for for ages. But, you know, he's basically very, very enmeshed in in learning from uh, things like um, um, Sydney Decker. So basically, basically all of the research about uh, accidents and incidents from other other completely other domains. It's how do you learn from that? And um so I think actually you're in a good position there because if you because you can bring that and say well we should act the same way that we already know is the way to approach um, uh, problems when things go wrong in a complex system uh, it's not because someone deliberately did something wrong it's because they couldn't work out what they should do or there were eight different things that all went wrong and they aligned in such a way that it hit you and it's extremely rare it's extremely rare that you can ever be involved in an incident and think, oh, that person wasn't doing their best. It's just not, it's not really, yeah, it's not really a thing. I think, Stephen, in your opening question, you made an interesting point 
some of us engineers work on the weekends on this stuff, I think we have latent needs and they have now become expectations. So 20 years ago, there were no, there were have any places like the FT to work. Nowadays, as a developer or an engineer, or in fact, any type of professional, there's a whole range of places where you can work, where your need, your professional needs for safety, for creativity will be met. Uh, and I think that's one of the key shifts that the cloud native community has contributed to. Netflix have helped to drive that already starting 20 years ago. So I would say the world's your oyster. Yeah, <laughs> There's lots of nice places to work. The FT is definitely one of them. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, okay. I'm going, to, I'm going to shuffle the questions along because I'm conscious of time and we want to make sure that everybody gets their needs satisfied, uh, as it were. Uh, so I think the next person on my list was Andy. Andy, hello. Hello. Uh, first of all, thanks, Sarah. That's been really, really insightful. I've made copious, copious notes. Um, lots of things to look up. Uh, one question I did have. Um, you, you talked about your, your reliability team um, in the model of an enabling team from team topologies. Mm -hmm. um, We've, we've been experimenting with this format uh, as well, but what we're struggling with is the kind of, the interaction between that team and other teams and how you yeah. manage that. So how, pe how people request the help and how you make sure that it doesn't turn into a, you know, a three month yak shave. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so we, I think we were already doing this before. I mean, I read Team Topologies and then went, oh, this is what we were already, doing and I think what we had what we'd appreciated is uh, you want to do as much stuff as possible where you build things that people can use without having to come and talk to you about it you obviously go in and you support people but a lot of what we did initially when we when we set up the team was we thought well what information would people like so we we thought we need to, we need to to know who owns everything and we need it to be in a graph so we moved it from a flat from a relational database into a graph because that then allowed us to start adding new new things we took an approach of um, if you want to start storing some information into into that graph uh, come and talk to us and you can do it and that started like one of my members of my team found all the spreadsheets at the FT that listed systems with some other information. And he had a list of about 35 spreadsheets. And we were like, well, they should all live in this graph. They should all, but you can come and add that if you want. Um, and visualization we found quite useful. So when we were trying to improve the quality of our run books, we, um, we created this thing called the system operability score that gave you a score. Um, so we, what are our critical fields? And we kind of, munched, we said, it's pretty like, we, we, we're trying to work out how to score it, but here's our score. And uh, we found some teams really responded to that in a very competitive way. For a while in Slack, I would constantly get teams sending me the fact that they'd overtaken my team in terms of the score on this. Um, so I guess, so one thing is thinking, how do you like, make it so it's appealing to people and they can, they'll come to it themselves and, and use it. Um, my other general thing is never ask people to be doing something unless you've already done the work yourself. Because quite often, I think a few years ago, we would say, oh, we'd like you to do this thing. We're building it this quarter, but could you then use it? Well, now we build it and then we go and we say to everybody, it's here, it's available. Can't, do you want to use it? Um, we run a lot of workshops. Um, it's trying to, yeah, you're trying to work out how to take a few people and satisfy a lot of demand. The best way to do that is to build things that people can do self-service um, and documentation and and stuff like that. I don't know if that answers it enough, but it's, it's um, so I, I, I was really interested to read quite a few years ago, a book about nudge theory. So behavioral economics, which is something that's very popular in the government. And they, they did some research that said, um, if you, send a letter to people asking them to complete their tax return and you say 95% of people in your area have done it by now, people are more likely to do it. If you send letters to people that address them by name. So very small things can have a big impact um, in things. And um, I've, I've given a talk about this. It's basically look at making things, um, making things easy for people to do, uh, attractive so they can see what the benefit is, um, social because we're very social so we'll we'll do something if we see other people are doing it and give it to them at the right time so timely so it's an east east framework is saying if you concentrate on those things and you nudge people um it's people don't like being dragged but you can definitely persuade them and show them the value and they'll they'll do it themselves very good okay cool andy i, I saw i saw you gave that question a thumbs up so we're really grateful that you asked and um, we're also very happy that you got an answer to that question i would love to go on forever but time uh, is currently upon us 
Um, so I think a couple of things, just as a follow up to the platform question, um, the, what the, the, the most attended webinar we ever did was with Matthew Skelton from Team Topologies. Carla will share the link now in the chat box, but he's coming back. Now, Sarah, I'm going to ping you privately and maybe we can squeeze you back in as a guest for the QA. <laughs> There's obviously an overlap, but I know you're very busy, but I'll, I'll discuss that with you later. Um, there will be a recording of this talk shared. I would like to add my compliment, actually, Sarah, because you know that my obsession is becoming an obsession now, is the link between leadership and principles and the actual implementation thereof, policies, workflows. So this was my favourite, what the fuck it are, because it, it shows you the principle, you build it, you run it, and then all of the mountainous amounts of work you have to do to make that real in your organisation. So that's uh, that's my feedback. I, I love that, and I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the recording. Thank With you. that in mind, let me begin by thanking, first of all, Carla for organising, along with Teresa for bringing all of this together, Ian and Adrian Moat for covering my dumbass when I turned up late. And then finally, one more final round of applause and thank you to Sarah Wells from the Financial Times for what was probably the best webinar we've had so far. Thank you so much. And we'll see you all next time. Thank you, everybody. Have a lovely day. Bye. 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 Bye.